everybody. Good evening. <coughs> Is it night? Yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys ready to sing praises to our God? Yeah, yeah. Good. Hey, uh, can y'all stand together and we sing this first song? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Hey kids, who's uh, who's ready for Christmas to get here? Yeah. So that anticipation that we feel about Christmas getting here and that time together with our families, our loved ones to celebrate the birth of Jesus and that um, the beauty of that time together is is uh, call that longing, right? When you're when you're waiting in anticipation for something. I want you to think for a minute about the the nation of Israel as they had heard the promise of the Messiah who would come, the king who would reign over them forever, who would deliver them from all of their enemies and who would bring in peace uh, to the nation of Israel uh, and, uh, and how they had heard that promise through the prophets of this coming king, this coming Messiah who would deliver them. And think about their longing for that to happen. And that's kind of what this song is about. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Which means what? God with us, right? Yeah, God with us. And we also sing O come, O come, Emmanuel at the same time, right? We want to see Jesus' return. And we also long for his presence in our lives every day, right? So we sing O come, O come, Emmanuel into our situation, into our lives. We, we know it now. We know what they didn't know. We know that Jesus was the, the promised Messiah. and We know that he came to deliver his people from their sins and he came as a, a spiritual king. And we know that he gave the gift of the promised Holy Spirit to all who would believe in him. And, and we are on that side of it now. We live in what the prophets longed to know. Um, but we still long for the full um, measure of, of God's peace on earth and in our lives uh, for our full sanctification, being set apart for his glory in every aspect, right? So we sing with them, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let's sing this together.
Father God, we come before you this evening to praise you, uh, to praise your name, to worship you. And Lord, we, we want to be in your presence. We want to be intimate with you, close to you. We want to know your presence in our lives. We want to walk closely with our Lord and our Savior. We want to give you glory. And Lord, we want to love you back. For we see how much you have loved us by sending your son, Jesus. Thank you so much, God. Fill our hearts now with joy. Help us to lift our voices to you as we should. Lord, be glorified in this place and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. gift from God. Psalm 32 says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. How blessed we are to have a savior, one who came to rescue us from our sins. How blessed we are to be his.
favor. If I get all choked up, that's what happens. Thinking about my mom. And about the incredible words he said.
All right, we're going to sing one more. Jesus, we lift up your name and we praise you. God, we thank you that you sent your son to be our savior, that you, as the psalm says, have become for us our salvation. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we give you thanks in this place and in our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Thank y'all for singing along. <laughs> that was real nice.
When darkness covered the earth, God said, let there be light. When the Israelites were lost in the desert night, God illuminated their camp with a pillar of fire. When David was overwhelmed, still he sang, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When humanity seemed forever lost, the prophets believed God would provide a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. When the wise men were seeking the newly born king, they followed the light of a rising star. And where death had darkened the world, that king, Jesus, cried out, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So this year, as you plug in your Christmas lights, remember, the darkness of death has been banished by the light of the world. Merry Christmas. I've got no sound. Oh, there I am. If you want to get a head start, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 2. If you need a Bible, of course, there's always those on the back table. Everybody there, everybody at Luke chapter 2? We good? Make sure I am. Yep, I'm there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this time of the year in particular, where we take the time we set aside the time to remember the birth of our Lord and our Savior. Lord, there's lots of things that go on during this time of the year. Lots of, of traditions and, and things that we all enjoy. Lots of things that can be distractions. But lots of things that bring us wonderful joy together as family. Lord, I pray that in all of these things that we would keep Jesus first. Lord, as we study your word this evening, I pray that we would be blessed by what we read and that we would pack away these things into our hearts to meditate on them, think about them and talk to others about them we pray this in the name of your precious son Jesus, amen it seems to me like there were, used to be a lot more nativity scenes out <laughs> when I was a kid I don't know why maybe maybe it that may not even be the case maybe there weren't nativity scenes out everywhere but it seemed to me that everywhere I turned when I was a kid around this time of the year obviously you would see a nativity scene um, you don't see as many these days it seems like you see them but just not as many uh, well I saw an inflatable one the other day thought that was interesting. I was in Home Depot. (laughs) 
Okay. Well, there's one there, too. There's two of them. They got two nativity scenes. All right. Well, I think that you used to see them a lot more than you do today. Um, even government buildings, you used to see them at government buildings, and that, of course, is less and less over time. I think one other thing that's kind of happened is over the course of time, even Christians have started to kind of look down on the nativity scene, criticizing it for its inaccuracies. I mean, we all know that the wise men weren't there at the same time as the shepherds and, and all of that. And I think it's, it's become, like so many other things in Christianity, so many other traditions, it's become trendy to kind of set those aside. Um, hymns have kind of gone the same way in a lot of ways, you know. But the more that I study Scripture, the more that I mature in my faith, the more I find that there is great wisdom in the traditions and in the hymns. And yes, the traditional nativity is certainly in several ways inaccurate to what Scripture tells us, but it's also wonderful. It's, it's a collage, a, a mixture of things that you wouldn't expect to find together, picturing for us God's unimaginable grace. the birth of our Savior. I mean, in the scene, we find the Son of God born into the world in humility, not the way that you would expect the Savior of the world to be born. Born to parents of the bloodline of David, but without riches or honor, and of little means, everyday, ordinary people. We find shepherds unruly outcasts of the day. We find animals, camels, donkeys, sheep. And we find wise men from another land, Gentiles, guided to Jesus by God. Isaiah 9-6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now taken as a whole, it's a wonderful testimony of how Christ was not only born into the family of man, but also the fact that he was given to us. And the nativity reminds us that the gospel isn't just for one group of people. The gospel is for all who will receive Jesus, rich, poor, royal, common, all people of all walks of life. The good news of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is offered to anyone who will call upon his name. And the nativity and, and Christmas remind us that God has made a way through his son Jesus. We're going to be reading through Luke chapter 2 this evening. Not the whole chapter, just the first 12 or so verses. And as we do that, I want you, to, you guys to do me a favor. We don't do this a whole lot. Um, in fact, I don't think we've ever done this. But as I read, if you guys would read along with me, okay? And we'll put it up on the screen because we probably all have slightly varied translations, and that would be just kind of crazy if we were all reading at the same time from different translations. Um, so it will be up on the screen, and just read along with me as we go. Um, I'm in the New King James Version. If the screen doesn't keep up <laughs> and you're in the New King James Version, then you're golden. But uh, otherwise, just be warned. But Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 first, says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, 
his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The Bible tells us that that Joseph took his pregnant wife Mary to his ancestral home of Bethlehem to take part in this mandatory census. Now Bethlehem, which means house of bread, is located five or six miles outside of Jerusalem. It was the home of Israel's most famous king, David, of whose line God promised the Messiah would come. Luke tells us that Joseph was not only from Bethlehem, but was also a descendant of King David. And and Israel family connections were very, very important. Not just immediate family, but also extended family. And hometown was very important too. Often families remained rooted in their hometown, at least part of the family. So when Joseph came into Bethlehem, and said, I'm Joseph, my father is Heli, whose father was Matat, who was son of Levi, then rules of hospitality would require that someone in the town make space for him and his family. Not to show hospitality to a stranger, much less a family member, would have been incredibly shameful. You know, Joseph was not just a hometown boy. His lineage was royal. He was from the line of David. Most towns and villages claim some kind of local pride in something. For instance, since around 1910, Claxton, Georgia has been the fruitcake capital of the world. I believe that refers to the baked goods kind of fruitcake. Another example, another example is Tupelo, Mississippi, that's known for being the birthplace of Elvis. Well, Bethlehem was the hometown of Israel's most famous king, David. And verse 4 there shows us that it was still known as that when Luke wrote this book. But we've got to wonder, wasn't Jerusalem also known as the city of David? Well, it isn't unusual for two places with a similar connection to use the same title. Dayton, Ohio uses the title of birthplace of powered flight. So does Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina. And while Jerusalem was the city that David captured and that he built his kingdom on, he was born, raised, and anointed king by the prophet Samuel in Bethlehem. Now, the Hebrew scriptures refer to Jerusalem as the city of David 43 times, but it appears that at least locally, Bethlehem continued to be known as the city of David. In regards to to being welcomed in Bethlehem and given a place to stay, Mary's circumstance is also important. In the culture of the region, childbirth was an important community event. And it's hard to think that Joseph, you know, the hometown boy of the line of David and his very pregnant wife would be denied a place to stay. And let's not forget that earlier in this gospel, Luke told us that Mary had visited relatives nearby in the hill country of Judea. If Bethlehem had not been hospitable to them, then Joseph surely would have taken Mary to stay with uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth who had given birth to the prophet that would be known as John the Baptist by this point. And it seems that there may have been time to make such arrangements before the baby was born. Verse 6 says that Jesus was born while they were there. It suggests that they had been in town a while before Mary gave birth. Now my point in bringing these things up is that it seems unlikely that Joseph and Mary would only or, or could only find a barn uh, or a cave. Some people say it may have been a cave to lodge in. And you know what? Well, the text doesn't even say 
that Jesus was born in a barn. Nor is there a statement from uh, an innkeeper saying that they could uh, not stay in the inn or that they could stay in the barn connected to the inn. It's, it's an assumption that's been made over time, and it, it's made because of the, that presence of the manger. I mean, it seems logical if you've got a feeding trough for an animal and you're staying in a place that has a feeding trough for an animal, you're probably staying in a barn, right? Well, that's, that's kind of our modern thought process. We don't have farm animals in our house, so they must have been staying in a barn. But after some research, I don't think that's the case. Now think back with me to Judges chapter 11, and, and there you remember that a certain man, a judge, made a very rash vow. That man was Jephthah. In Judges 11.31 it says, Then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, how many of us, if we were, say, going out to do something, oh, job interview or something, and, and you know, how many of us would, would make a vow to the Lord that what, the first thing that comes out of the house when we get home, we'll offer up to him as a burnt offering? Um, probably none of us, because that would be one of our kids, right? That would be coming out of the house. Well, why would Jephthah make a vow like that when coming out of his house you would think would likely be uh, his wife or kids well Jephthah surely he would have been thinking of an animal sacrifice you know so why wouldn't he have then said well whatever comes out of my barn or whatever is uh, eating out out in the field Well, it just happens to be the case that very often animals were kept in the house. The Bible records, and you guys, I'm sure you remember this, in 1 Samuel 28, when Saul is consulting the medium, what does she have in her house readily available? A fatted calf. Archaeology has found that, that many of the domestic buildings in that region actually in the bottom floor of the house had a manger. Now, that suggests that animals were often kept in at least the lower floor of the house. And there's good reason. Um, In the winter, it could get very cold. You'd have the little extra body heat rising up from, from below, right? You'd have protection for important animals. You'd also have convenience, just go downstairs to milk the cow, right? Well, as strange as it sounds to us, it was the case that the most vulnerable of the farmyard animals, the pregnant animals, the donkeys, uh, animals that were set aside for sacrifice, like the Passover lamb, would be kept inside the house on the ground floor. But what about the inn where they sought shelter? Well, Maybe not wanting to be a burden on the family, Joseph and Mary first sought room in a local inn, but because so many people were in town, there was no room. But there's only one problem with that. The Greek word for inn that's used here is not the usual Greek word for hotel, which surely Luke would have used if that was in his intent. In fact, Luke uses the proper Greek word for inn later on in describing how the Good Samaritan took the half-dead man uh, to an inn. The word used in Luke chapter 2, it means guest room or lodging place. And the only other place where this particular word is used in regards, is in regards to the upper room where Jesus and his disciples ate Passover before his arrest and crucifixion. So when Luke says that there was no room at the inn, his point is that at the particular house where Joseph and Mary was staying, the guest room was already occupied. 
Joseph and Mary stayed in the ground floor room occupied by animals, and that is where Jesus was born. It doesn't change the story, though it might change the traditional um, venue of the nativity. But still, it's, it's compelling for several significant reasons. First, this would have been the same place that a lamb meant for sacrifice at Passover would have been kept. In Exodus 12, Moses instructed that each family was to keep the Passover lamb inside the house for four days. John the Baptist, upon seeing Jesus coming to be baptized at the Jordan, he proclaimed in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, second, Jesus' birth was likely in the early fall at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. The Gospel of John says, in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek word translated dwelt means tabernacled, which means to take up residence. Had Jesus been born in a barn or out in a cave somewhere, he would have been outside of the house, but while he was born in humble circumstances, he was born in the house. And this is the most important bit for us tonight, I believe. If, if what I've presented here is the way it all happened, then we have to recognize that the Christmas story is not about rejection and being alone. Instead, it tells us that God the Father made sure that his son was born into this world in the company of family. The traditional nativity presents us with a, a lonely barn with only mom and dad and a few shepherds and some animals in attendance. The wise men wouldn't have been there yet. They probably arrive, they, they arrive probably up to two years later. Actually, that's according to Matthew 2. But if they were staying with family, there would have been family members present, maybe even Zacharias and Elizabeth. Maybe they came in for it for the occasion. And by the way, all of this that I've presented, it matches with the Messianic prophecies just as they're presented in Scripture. So instead of Jesus being born in rejection and in lonely circumstances, the focus actually appears to be the opposite. God the Father made sure that his son was born into this world surrounded by family. The nativity, which means the birth of Jesus at the time and in the place predicted by the prophets, it's about inclusion. So then it's a reminder that family is important to God. And if it's important to God, it should be important to us too. God doesn't want us to be alone or to try to walk spiritually by ourselves. Family is critical and essential for our own well-being. But beyond bi biological family, there's our spiritual family. Some of, us, we, some of us don't have biological family with us on Christmas. Others have difficult family relationships that trouble or restrict joyful celebration. But Jesus, during his ministry, added some important insights about family that can help to bridge these kind of relationship gaps. One day when his own mother and his brothers came to speak to him, he told the crowd that his mother, brothers, and sisters were those who do the will of his Father in heaven. One of the great lessons from the first Christmas is the wonderful truth that God wants us all to have family and to be connected. At Christmas time, when many people feel all alone, the nativity reminds us that God understands and wants us to have family. And we are able. We should look for those who are alone. We should offer them company. But ultimately, the nativity is about our inclusion in God's family. Remember the verse we read earlier, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. God included his son in our family so that through his sacrifice and resurrection on the cross, we could be included in his family. Now read with me starting at verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living in, out in the fields, keeping watch. <laughs> and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The circumstances of Jesus' birth were simple. In Joseph's hometown, on the bottom floor of a house with family and friends, a donkey, and maybe even a moo cow. But out in the fields of Bethlehem, where the Passover lambs were being raised, the announcement was a little less reserved. A herald of God, an angel, stood before the shepherds and announced the birth of the Messiah, followed by an army of angels praising God and proclaiming God's blessings of peace and goodwill on humanity. What a glorious and wonderful announcement of such a wonderful, simple thing. The gospel is that. It's a simple thing. You know, God could have made it complicated. He could have created a bunch of steps and levels that you have to attain before you could even be considered for salvation. Instead, God, it, God made it very simple. He made it as simple as this, for whoever calls the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's what makes this announcement of the birth of Jesus so glorious. You know, some argue that Christianity is narrow-minded, that it's elitist. That couldn't be any further from the truth. God has set before all of humanity a very simple message. It's a plan that is open to anyone who is willing to receive it. Jesus didn't come to bring religion. Religion is man's attempt to reach God, and that is impossible. Christianity, on the other hand, is God reaching down to man. We cannot, by our own efforts, cross that gap that sin has created. So Jesus made the way. Romans 5, 8 through 11 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. There are traditions that surround the birth of Jesus, and those traditions really come out during Christmas. Many wonderful things that remind us of our wonderful Savior. Nati nativity sets are one of them. And though they're often not biblically accurate, they are still meaningful, reminding us of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. The events of Jesus' birth are more marvelous than words or, or any display can express. He was born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem, exactly as prophesied many years before. Jesus was conceived in Mary, not by man, but by the Holy Spirit of God. As the Apostle John wrote, Jesus existed before the creation of the world. He is part of the Holy Trinity that we know as God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Son of God came in human form for a purpose. He came to die as a willing sacrifice in payment for the sins of mankind. And he did this to provide eternal salvation as a free gift to everyone who will accept it and follow him. Christmas is not about the Savior's infancy. It's about his deity. The reality that God was born into the world without forsaking his divine nature or diminishing his deity, he was born into our world as a tiny baby. He was fully human with all the needs and emotions that are common to each and every one of us. Yet he was also fully God, all wise and all powerful. Colossians chapter 1 I think puts it best this way, and we'll close with this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross what a grand and wonderful thing to celebrate so merry christmas to everyone and let's close in prayer lord jesus light of the world as we celebrate you and your birth this Christmas, may we see the world in the light of your great sacrifice. Just as you chose the poor and the lowly to receive the greatest news that the world has ever known, so may we worship you in meekness of heart. As you ministered among the weak, the hungry, and even those who hated you with patience and caring. May we also be patient and caring and gracious. Thank you for the gift of your love. May we be a shining example of that love to others. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, that your story has become our story as we celebrate your birth. Amen.